Okay. Okay, so welcome to our, oh, what month is it now? March program for the Camino Wildlife Habitat Project. And um, it's, it's such a lovely night. We're glad that you're joining us to learn more about owls. And I'm excited that Shona is coming to tell us about this. But before she starts, I want to give you a little bit of information about our Camino Wildlife Habitat Project. So we are a community wildlife habitat and our goal is to create an island in harmony with nature one yard at a time. And we're currently up to 1,043 certified wildlife habitats on the island and we're working toward 1,100. So if you um, know about the project, then please spread the word. And if you don't, um, well, here's some information about it. So what we're trying to do is to um, think about uh, action steps for all the habitat loss. So you can look at the map there and you can see that we don't have as much green space. But if we do things in our own yards, we can actually link up spaces. So uh, Russell Link, he's a wildlife biologist uh, for Fish and Wildlife in Washington State. He lives on Whidbey and he has a book called Living with Wildlife and Landscaping, two books, and Landscaping for Wildlife. And he talks about areas. So area one is your um, area close to the house. Um, where you kind of landscape and, and, and you're there about. So that might be where you put your beach bird feeders and your um, bird bath where you can see things. And area two is kind of a mixed zone that you go through, but not as much. And area three is where it's, you, you're not, the back part of the yard where you're not necessarily around so much. So if a lot of people merge their a area threes, we can actually restore some corridors. And that's what we're, we're hoping on Camino. And a yard can be uh, well, a certified wildlife habitat can be a rooftop garden, a deck, or it can be 50 acres like Four Springs Lake Preserve, so, or more acres than um, like our parks that are certified. So anyway, this is our action step on the island, and it, it's a process. It's like you don't have to be a perfect wildlife habitat. So when we moved to Camino in November of 1994, we um, had a lawn in front and, and my house is down below on, at, at the beach level and then we have a long strip. So the front part of the yard um, near the water was grass. And so then, you know, in 2007, we kind of had the left side of the property, which is the south side, that was kind of built up and we we're still working on the right side or the north side. And now um, it's real lush. And so like in the summer, the neighbors on the, who their houses are on the top of the hill, it's just dry grass and I go up to this green lush um, place that has the layering with ground cover, bushes and, and trees. And so it's a nice habitat for the wildlife and it's really quite lovely to be at, being on a hot summer day. It's kind of fun in the winter too, the snow. And so a certified wildlife habitat has food, water, shelter and a place to raise young, so some space. Whoops. And also, it's thinking about responsible gardening. So by reducing lawn, a lawn that, a, a yard that has like a lawn and a tree is, is pretty sterile. So that's why we talk about um, layering and growing natives. It's especially nice, especially um, for those of you who live on an island like most of us do, because we have issues about water in our single source aquifer. So growing natives uh, gets into water conservation. And, and we want to think about uh, reducing the chemicals that we put in the yards. And that helps the wildlife as well as us because our water is groundwater and, and we drink what we put into our land. So um, you don't have to be a purist, but as you do more with your certified wildlife habitats in this you know, work in progress, then you start, uh, we, people start to think about you know, what we're doing in our yards. And, um, and how, you know, like in the win in the fall, we don't rake up all our big leaf maple leaves. We just kind of let them be. And then by springtime, they kind of have deteriorated and they've been good, good um, ground cover and, and whatnot for the, the birds and such in the winter and, and provide a lot of nutrients for the trees that are in the areas. And trees kind of feed themselves when they drop their leaves. And so thinking about the plant material or our brush piles, if we layer things in the back area threes of our yard, then um, that can be a, a good source of shelter for um, the critters. Okay, and um, 
and it's also our action step. So by doing that um, and watching the, uh, you know, if you're watching the logs roll off the island is kind of sad, and that's why uh, we started the project because it's like we wanted an action step. So this uh, certifying a community um, helps us do that. So to certify is, is quite simple. There's an application. You can find it on our website. You can also go to the Camino Library, and uh, right outside there's a little, uh, little kiosk that has applications in, and it's a simple checkoff how you provide food, water, shelter, and place to raise young. It's a matter of um, you don't have to be pure at the, you know, it doesn't have to be a perfect wildlife habitat. It's like a work in progress. So like my yard, you know, we didn't get rid of all the grass all at once. That would be, well, that would be kind of overwhelming. So, you know, you just kind of do things as you see fit. But I know now I think about what I'm going to get at the uh, nursery when I go to get new plants. Or I think about adding some water to my bird bath. So in the summer when it gets hot. So it just kind of adds that little conscientiousness about um, living with the wildlife on the island. And once you certify, you can put up a sign. So we have our signs. Um, and if you want to do that, all I need to know is your number. And I can meet you like at the Camino's uh, park and ride where the uh, coffee roaster is in the library. Um, and for a sign, and you can also certify, give your certify certification number to the. Um, I have to. My phone is ringing. I have to muffle that. So you can also, um, when you put up a sign, what it does is it helps with uh, letting people know I get calls because people say, "Oh, I can do that. Um, why don't you? Um, why? How can I get a sign?" And it's like, "Well, you certify." And so this is our this is kind of some publicity for our project. So you can see we have a lot of dots on the island. Um, all these people have certified these red dots, and it's kind of with the idea of reestablishing corridors. And so if you're interested, all you need to do is certify, and you can be one of the dots. And these are all the communities that have certified. So you have to have a percentage of your community certified as wildlife habitats to get the community certification. Have demonstration gardens and do some education programs. And so for more information, you can go to the National Wildlife Federation website, and you can certify online with them. And also our website, and Roxy's done a fabulous job with the website. You can go and get native plant, um, a native plant list. You can watch old recordings of our programs. I know the drain field, landscaping the drain field is a real popular one. Um, Shona was here. Oh, was it last year during in February or March? I think it was February, and did a program on um, the baby season and, and being careful with the wildlife and the babies coming. So she, you can watch her um, her program when she did that. And so there's a lot of different things on our website. And here are the books I mentioned, uh, the top two, by Russell Link, and it's that specific Northwest. So it's it's available for our area and, and it makes sense for what we need to know. And then the a more general one that the National Wildlife puts out. And then um, here is some information about the tour. So if you are interested in going on a tour of um, Wolf Hollow, we, um, Shona's going to give a tour for about 10 people. So it, it's, a, it's a small group, but that this is information and we'll put it on the um in the chat as well if you're interested in that you need to let us know it's this saturday and that's information about fairy times and whatnot so it's over in friday at in friday harbor or well it's out of friday harbor out of town and it'll be about a 60 to 90 minutes long and so um, we have to take an early morning ferry and then a, a later afternoon ferry, so you can kind of do things in Friday Harbor after um, the tour. So if you're interested in that, let us know, because it is limited. Um, you won't see animals being treated or birds being treated because they're patients, and they're, as patients, they, are not, they don't get a lot of human exposure because they need to go back to the wild. But you can see the facilities and understand I know I went several years ago, and it was fun to see um, the, where the seal pups were um, being cared for. We had a seal pup on the island that we that Wolf Hollow helped us with and to rescue it a few years ago, several years ago. 
So with that, um, that's what I have. So I will introduce you to Shona. So let me stop the share here and then I will I will um, tell you about these are not available. <laughs> I have Oh, well, hold on. Uh, sorry, I've got something go. Let me. Sorry, someone can't get into the Zoom and I, um, but I can't really do two things at once, so I will help with that in a minute. So first, let me tell you about the programs. We have a, we do third Wednesday of the month programs. So if you want to know about native plants, that will be on April 19th. And then on May 17th, we will have uh, a program on pollinators. And um, when, if you have questions tonight, we will have um, those at the end of the program. So now I am ready to introduce Shona. And so, Shona is, um, she's been with uh, Wolf Hollow for, for several years, and um, she has a degree in biology and environmental science. She's from Scotland, and um, she worked for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds um, as a countryside ranger. She was at the um, Marine Station in Sweden for two years. Then she moved to the San Juan Islands in 1990 and was a volunteer at Wolf Hollow and then later became um, a member of the rehab education staff. And now she's the education coordinator and has been doing that for a long time and a great job. She's a busy, busy person. I know I, I see her usually in Anacortes for the wooden boat festival, I think, or the maritime festival. And then um, she's at the different state parks on in the San Juans each week in the summer, uh, spreading the word because um, I know that I think of Wolf Hollow as my, um, oh, I'm, I'm just, as the, the rehab people in Shona are my heroes because uh, it's, it's so sad when the uh, critters are suffering because of human um, negligence and Wolf Hollow and crew are there to help out. So with that, Shona is going to tell us about owls. So thank you so much, Shona Aitken, okay. for um, being with us tonight. Okay. And here she goes. Thank you. Okay, yeah, okay. We skipped one. Okay, so as you can see, our topic for this evening is all about owls. And I liked giving this talk, not because I'm a great expert on owls, but because I find them fascinating. And I know a lot of other people do too. And I think partly that's because they're kind of mysterious because other birds are out during the day, we can watch them at our feeders, we can you know, use binoculars to watch them flying by, but owls mostly tend to be out during the night and we don't get to look at them as much and perhaps just hear a sound in the woodland and wonder what it is. So there's a little bit of mystery about owls. So what I'd like to do this evening is talk first about some general characteristics of owls uh, the sort of ad adaptations for the, the, their lifestyle, and then talk about the different types of owls that are found in our region. And I, I realize that most of my knowledge comes from the San Juan Islands, and there may be some differences in the types of owls that you see on Camino, but I think most of the ones we have in the region are kind of common to most areas, but maybe at the end we can discuss the differences owls that you're seeing or hearing that I don't see or vice versa. So all about owls. Well, as I said, they're interesting creatures and there's various characteristics about them. They can be large or small. They have different ways of hunting. They eat a wide range of different prey, but there are a few things that they tend to have, most owls tend to have in common. So just looking at some of these, the first thing is owl's ears. 
Now, when we think of ears, this is a, a great horned owl with these great big ear tufts. And I discovered recently that an official title for them is plumicorns, which I think is a great word. So these ear tufts are absolutely nothing to do with hearing. They are just feather tufts and they're more related to uh, communication between owls and display than they are with hearing. So we usually see them looking like this, but the great horned owl and other owls can lay them back. And if you look at this from the side, it looks like that. So there are little muscles that enables them to raise these ear tufts, these feather tufts, lay them back, so it's all to do with display and behavior. But owls do have incredibly acute hearing and they have huge ear holes. It always amazes me when we're examining an owl and we're looking, especially an owl that has a head injury, we're looking at the ears to see if there's any bruising and there are these huge orifices. And some of them have a little flap and a perculum that covers over the ear but often they're the big holes that are hidden behind the feathers around the face disc. But the most amazing thing about owls' ears is that they're asymmetrical. So one ear is considerably higher than the other. And I can remember holding a, I think it was a barred owl for exam and looking down and I could see its ear about I would think of sort of forehead level. And the other ear was probably down about chin level. So they, are, they can be very asymmetrical. And in different types of owls, the one will be higher than the other. And the reason for that is that it helps with their hearing accuracy because they can tell to 30 millionths of a second the difference in timing for a sound to get to the right ear and their left ear. And that can help them pinpoint exactly where a little squeak or little rustle is coming from and therefore where their prey is. And you see sometimes owls will turn the heads to the right or to the left, or what they're doing is triangulating, getting it pinpoint accurate where that little sound is coming from. And barn owls, for instance, their left ear is always higher than their right ear. One of these lovely pieces of information you can amaze your friends with. But amazing difference in the levels of their ears to help with the acuity of their hearing. And owls' eyes, of course, many of them are hunting in the dark or in low light conditions. So they have very large eyes. In fact, their eyes, are, eyes can be 5% of their body weight. That, that's kind of like us having eyeballs the size of tennis balls, quite incredibly large. They also have, they're packed with the, the light sensitive rods and not many of the uh, more color sensitive cones. So they're all about picking up the slightest bit of light and using that to navigate to see what's going on. And one of the strange things about owls' eyes, their pupils can contract and can constrict or dilate, but they can do that independently in two, the two different eyes. So most of us, both of our eye, our, our pupils will contract or dilate together, but owls can do it independently, which is, looks really weird when you see it, and it freaks out people who are involved in human medicine, because if you see that in a person, you think they have a major head injury. The owls, they can just do that. So their eyes are incredible. And this is the skull of a great horned owl. So these huge eye, they're actually more of a tube than an eyeball, but their huge eyes are supported and protected by these scleral or sclerotic rings, little bony plates that protect and hold that huge eye. But that means that they can't turn their eyes very easily. So they can't look right and left, up and down the way we can. 
Instead, they have extra vertebrae in their necks. They have 14 vertebrae, which is about twice as many as we have. So they can turn their heads about 270 degrees round and also almost upside down. So rather than turning their eyes, they can turn their heads around to get a good look at things or to triangulate in and where that sound is coming from. Their, their neck is very flexible. And like most birds, they have this nictitating membrane that comes across the eye. So as in addition to the eyelids, they have this membrane that comes from the inside, goes out over the eye, it protects the eye and keeps it clean. So it looks very weird when they do that. This is a young barred owl, but that helps protect these huge eyes. And owl's feet are interesting. In some ways, they're very similar to other raptors. They have these curved, sharp talons for grabbing and holding prey. But owl's feet tend to be, well, their toes tend to be a little shorter and stouter than raptors, other raptors of the same size. They're stronger feet. And you'll notice these little soft, fluffy feathers all the way down onto their toes. That's a typical owl thing. Most raptors have bare legs, bare toes, but owls have feathers all the way down, almost to the top of their talons. Uh, the theory is that this helps not only with warmth, but also with, with uh, silent flight and silent movement because it breaks up the air currents. And the other thing about owls, they are capable of moving one of their toes. So they can have three toes forward and one back, the hallux, the sort of thumb back to grip, or they can move one digit round and have two toes forward and two toes back. I believe the official title is zygodactylus, if you like big words. So owls can do this. This is a barred owl. It has one foot tucked up and the other foot has two toes forward and two toes back. There's only a few other birds like woodpeckers, etc., that can do that. And owls feathers. So this is a young short-eared owl, still with some of the down, but it looked like it was wearing a tutu. It had grown its adult feathers in the top part, but still had all these fuzzy feathers lower down. Owl feathers tend to be very soft. They're strong, but they're soft and buoyant and light, which is a great advantage when they're flying and trying to fly silently, but it doesn't work too well when it rains heavily. So a lot of heavy rain can really uh, soak an owl and prevent it going out hunting if there's prolonged rainy weather. And this is the leading edge of the feathers on a barred owl wing. And instead of having a sharp edge that kind of cuts through the air and makes a sort of whooshing sound like a raven, owl wings have this sort of fringed effect, comb effect on the leading edge. So rather than cutting through the air, it breaks up the air currents and they can fly silently, which is of course really important if you're trying to creep up on mice or rats or that kind of thing. So all of these are to help these birds fly quietly and, and find their prey. So some of the other Interesting feathers are in the face disc. They have very stiff feathers radiating out the face disc. And this disc is kind of like a radar dish. It collects sounds and funnels them towards the ears, which are just behind that face disc. And if you look closely, right around the beak, around the ear, they have these tiny little feathers that are kind of like a cat's whiskers. They're almost like hair individual, and they're very sensitive. So if you look at it from the side, you can see that they stick out quite a way beyond the beak there. So owls have almost like cat's whiskers. So just a few of the things that are special about owls. 
that make them very uh, good at hunting, particularly in low light conditions. So what kind of owls do we have around here? Well, there are some that are here all year round, and there are some that are only here for part of the year. There are some that are pretty common, and you've got a good chance of seeing or hearing them. And there are others that are very rare. We don't see them very often, so it's special if you catch a glimpse. If we start with the biggest of the owls that is here all year round, the great horned owl, a big, strong, powerful owl. The obvious ear tufts that give it its great horned name and big yellow eyes, dark beak, dark brown mottled plumage and often white or creamy patch around the throat. So great horned owls are found almost everywhere throughout North America. And they can be very variable in color from reddish brown to more grayish brown and a wide range of sizes too. Uh, there are some that are as low as one and a half pounds and others that weigh five pounds. So these owls are very variable throughout the range. And they're also incredible generalists when it comes to habitat. You know, around here, we tend to think of them as being forest owls, but they can also inhabit more arid areas, open grassy areas, nest on cliffs instead of in trees. So they're very adaptable and cover a wide range of habitats. And they also eat a huge range of prey. Um, our joke at Wolf Hollow is, Great Horns Owl's attitude to life is, if it moves, kill it and eat it. If it's a little big, well, it'll just take a bit longer. They are incredible predators. They take everything from rodents, rabbits, skunks, raccoon kits, fox kits, uh, a wide range of birds, including other owls. And some of the people who um, studied peregrines on the recovery discovered that one of the reasons uh, youngsters did not survive was great horned owls taking them from the nests on cliff ledges. So great horned owls are formidable predators. And part of the reason for this is they have incredibly strong feet. They've been measured at a grit strength of 200 pounds per square inch, which is more than an e a bald eagle. And at one children's fair, we got a device that measures grip strength. And the challenge was to see if you could be as, as strong as a great horned owl. And one Big, big guy, worked in construction, great big guy, big hands. He tried it and he got to 180 pounds. So he could not beat the great horned owl for grip strength. So very strong. Now, when it comes to nesting, great horned owls are one of the first to do that, to start the whole process. So December, January, you can hear them calling back and forward to each other. Um, by January, they all usually have a nest settled, partly because they are not building their own nest. They usually take over the nest of um, maybe a red-tailed hawk or a raven or a crow, sometimes an abandoned nest, but sometimes they, they just take it over. And there's not many things argue with a great horned owl. So a stick nest in a tree is what we mainly see around here. So by February, they can have eggs. By maybe mid-March, the chicks have hatched. And then the youngsters, another nine, 10 weeks after that, before they are starting to fly. And, but they're with their parents through till about maybe September, because it takes them a long time to learn how to hunt well enough to be able to look after themselves. So this youngster is a few weeks old. And this is a fledgling great horned owl that's sitting on the top 
of one of the enclosures at Wolf Hollow. And it was making food begging calls to an injured great horned owl that was inside the enclosure. And this was in about July, a few years ago. So this youngster, you can see it's still got the down on the head, but it's flying well enough, but still begging to be fed from whatever great horned owl happens to be around. And this is a fully fledged youngster doing its threat display where they put their head down, they fluff their wings up, they try to look as big and mean and tough as possible. So of course, one of the most interesting thing about owls is the, the noises, the sounds they make. And every owl makes a range of sounds. So there can be territorial calls and there can be courtship calls and alarm calls. So I've just chosen one for each of the owls, but you can look up all the other sounds later. So this is the classic sound that we hear usually early in the season for great horned owls. So moving on, just a little bit smaller, the barred owl, uh, no ear tufts and dark eyes and a yellow beak as opposed to the yellow eyes that many of the owls have. So dark eyes, yellow beak, no ear tufts and a paler color, grayish brown and cream mottled, uh, horizontal stripes across the chest and vertical stripes on the belly and it's one of the owls you're most likely to see and hear because they don't tend to be as shy as some of the other owls. And they can also live in a wide range of habitats. They were originally further east and living in mature woodland there. But as the woodland in that uh, part of the country was changed, they gradually moved west. So some of the first barred owls records of breeding in Washington state come from, I think, 1975 or so. They just gradually moved west and they've adapted. So they can be in conifer forests, deciduous forests, marshy areas, a wide range. And they're often on the edges of woodland too, so they're very visible. They've, they've nested in parks, they've really adapted. Nesting, they often nest in a hollow in a tree, a crook of two big branches. And the youngsters, this one's probably just a few weeks old, will be in there for maybe nine, 10 weeks. And then they start to move out onto the branches, start to flap their wings, and then gradually fly, uh, take their first flights. And like a lot of owls, sometimes they end up on the ground. And the parents are nearby, protecting them usually. And within a few days, they can fly better again. But you see them on the ground before they're really able to fly. They're just taking their first flapping, um, semi-controlled fall to the ground at that point. But then they work their way back up through the branches again. They take a wide range of prey and everything, birds, mammals, they like snakes. And we had one instance where a big group of people were having a picnic under a big leaf maple tree in one of the local parks. They were all chatting, eating their sandwiches, when a barred owl dropped silently from the branches, grabbed a little garter snake right among the picnickers, and then flew back up to its perch to have lunch. So they just ignored the people who were more intent on the, the garter snake. So the youngsters go through the stages of growing in their feathers and losing the down. And they go through some really kind of funky looking stages where the last part to lose the down and get the real feathers is their head. So they have all these lovely, beautiful, soft, owly feathers, but their head still looks weird like this. 
Now, barred owls, as I said, are not quite as shy as some of the other owls, often seen during the day, sitting on the edge of woodland. They're also really chatty, and they have a wide range of different calls that they make. Now, most of us are familiar with the who cooks for you, who cooks for you now kind of call. But they make a wide range of shrieks and sounds that sound like a whole bunch of monkeys are chattering together. So here's just a few things for you to listen to. So yeah, the unmistakable sounds of a barred owl. Getting a little bit smaller again, a medium-sized owl, the barn owl. And they're in a different group of owls from most of the other forest owls that we've been talking about. So there are a few things about them that are different. But they're the only owl that's this lovely golden color with the gray flecks and have that beautiful heart-shaped white face disc. They've got longer legs. And rather than um, hunting by sitting on a perch and sitting and waiting and then dropping down the way great horned owls do, the way barred owls do, barn owls have longer wings for their body size and they hunt by flying low back and forward over open grassy areas to swoop down and catch mice or voles or other uh, small rodents mainly. So a different type of hunting and a slightly different body shape. The males and females look very similar, but there's a slight difference in color. The males tend to be paler colored and the females more orangey and more mottled on the chest and belly. So looking at these three youngsters, the one in the middle is probably a male. Uh, the one to its left is probably a female. The one to the right, um, not really sure, difficult to tell, but there are some color differences between male and female. In most of the owls, females are noticeably larger than the males. Barn owls, there's not always as much difference as some of the other owls. But one of the main differences comes to breeding time when they're raising the youngsters. Most owls, most birds, lay their eggs and then they begin incubating so that the youngsters hatch within a few days of each other. They're all about the same age. But barn owls don't do that. They continue to raise youngsters as long as there's food available. So they start laying eggs, hatch, raise the youngsters, and then keep on going. And they can start really early. Uh, often one of our first young birds of the year coming in in maybe March or so at Wolf Hollow are, are barn owlets. And so you can have, these are two youngsters from the same brood and look at the difference in size and development. They're probably about three or four weeks difference in age. And they just keep on going. So you can have five, six owlets, all at different stages, all within the same family. And a lot of what they eat are small rodents. So they're really good rodent control. If you think this family was, was in a barn, that the barn was old and was demolished. That's why we got these youngsters for care. But these five youngsters probably eat four or five mice or small rats each per night. So that is a lot of rodents that they were hunting around this farm.
So again, like most owls, they make a range of calls. And what you can't hear is this owl is doing its threat display. So they arch their wings, they lower their head, they're weaving back and forward. It's called toe brushing because their head is brushing across the top of their toes. They're clacking their beak, they're hissing, and they're making a sound there's a kind of screech that sets your teeth on edge. And all of that is the threat display to say, don't mess with me, I'm big and mean and tough. But if you hear an owl at night, a barn owl at night, this is probably what you'll hear. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a nice hooting owl at all. So there was barn owl, barn owls. And barn owls are found in all, every continent in the world apart from Antarctica. So there's owl, barn owls all over the world. Going again down in size a little bit, there's the short-eared owl. So-called because it has little tiny feather tufts on its head that often you can't really see. A beautiful little owl, a creamy colored tummy, and the back is a dark brown mottled. And the main thing about it is if you see its face, these beautiful orange eyes are surrounded by dark black, almost like it's wearing way too much mascara. So if you get to look at a short eared owl's face, that's the first thing that you notice. They are kind of like the barn owls in that they hunt by flying low back and forward over open grassy areas. They've got longish wings for the size of the owl and they fly with a, it's almost like a moth, a soft, slow flapping kind of, of motion. So when you see one, you can really see what's going on. And the thing about them is that they often hunt during the day. They're most active kind of dawn and dusk, but they're often visible during the day. So a lot of people love to watch short-eared owls. And on the south end of San Juan Island here, there's an area where the short-eared owls often are, and lots of people go out to try and get photographs. So as far as I know, most short-eared owls in the western side of the state are only here in the winter time. Almost all short-eared owls are nesting in eastern Washington. But there are exceptions to that. So short-eared owls are interesting because they nest on the ground in a, a clump of grass or up next to a bush, but they're nesting on the ground, which makes them very vulnerable in some ways. And these youngsters actually came from a nest uh, uh, near a runway at SeaTac Airport. They turned up on the, you know, just off the runway. And of course, the airport can't have birds nearby. They're worried about bird strikes and uh, airplane safety. So Bud Anderson from the Falcon Research Group helps with that kind of situation. So he got these youngsters and he brought them to us for care. And in a few months, they look like this. This one's even got its little ear tufts up so that you can see them and that beautiful plumage on the back. So that shows that there's probably are a few nesting somewhere in Western Washington, but the, all, the only ones I've ever seen have been in winter, fall and winter and early spring before they head out over to the east side breeding again. So beautiful owls hunting mainly voles and other small rodents, but um, also some small birds as well, and hunting by flying low back and forward, back and forward over the open grassy areas. And they hunt in the same kind of areas as northern harriers. So you might see some interactions between them when they're arguing over whose space this is.
And during the winter months, we certainly have a few of these on the San Juan Islands, but the Bow Edison area of the Skagit Flats is a great place to see short-eared owls. There's often quite a lot of them over the, the marshy areas there. And this is the sounds some of them make. We're moving on to an owl that's quite closely related to the short-eared owl, but not seen nearly as, uh, nearly as often, not as uh, common. The long-eared owl, these beautiful long feather tufts, little plume corns as they call them, and a really chestnutty brown face disc around these yellow eyes. It tends to be a tall, slender owl. And although they're related to the short-eared owls, uh, they hunt over open areas too, but they nest in trees and they roost in trees and they often take over a nest of a crow or something like that, a stick nest high up in the trees. So in some ways similar, but in other ways the behaviour is, is a bit different. And they're an owl that is pretty rarely seen. Again, most of them are nesting at east of the Cascades, but there are some breeding records from uh, Skagit County, Whatcom County, maybe King County. And we very, very rarely see them uh, in the area I'm familiar with. And this is one of the few that we've ever had at Wolf Hollow. In 40 years of Wolf Hollow's history, I think we've treated three long-eared owls. And this poor owl had flown into a barbed wire fence and got caught. You can see the damage on its face. Luckily, its eye wasn't damaged, but its face was torn. So it took a while for that to heal before it was able to be released. But three bar, uh, sorry, three long-eared owls in 40 years shows just how relatively rare these birds are. And the sound they make, if they were breeding in this area, and the male was ad advertising for a mate, this is what you might hear. And believe me, that goes on and on and on. So we'd be very lucky if we were able to catch a glimpse of a long-eared owl. So moving down to in size again, Western screech owls, little guys, you can see at 8.5 inches in height, a wingspan of 20 inches and only weighing about five ounces. So a little owl, uh, smaller in size than a robin. Little ear tufts, little yellow eyes and a really mottled plumage that is great camouflage. Because these little owls, they nest in uh, cavities in trees, often woodpecker holes, which shows just how important woodpeckers are for all these other little animals to, to nest in the holes that they've abandoned. So he relies on camouflage because bigger owls will eat them. So one of the ways they they keep themselves safe is to pretend to be a twig. And that looks very much like bark. Their plumage looks very much like bark. So they're hunting a range of different things. They're back to more of the woodland owls, the sit and wait kind of predators, finding a good perch and sitting up there waiting and then dropping down to catch a little mouse. Um, big black beetle, little bird, and there's even some video of street owls catching small fish in a stream. So a range of things, but usually sitting and then swooping down and, and grabbing something. So as I said, they nest in cavities and trees, and this is a, a nestling Western street owl. Uh, we got this for care when uh, somebody cut a tree down and there was two little owlets in the cavity. Sadly, one of them did not survive. So that's how we got this little guy. And again, you know, covered in down, 
and then gradually growing in its adult feathers until it has this lovely, lovely mottled plumage. So these little owls, as I said, can be preyed on by larger owls and they rely on camouflage. So they slit their eyes, they stand very tall and upright and sit very still and pretend to be a twig. And that can save them from being eaten by something like a great horned owl. And when we think of, of course, they're called Western screech owls for a reason. Obviously, they must make some kind of screech. But that's only one of the sounds. And one that I find much more interesting that you might hear during the courtship season is what we call the bouncing ball call. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that and wondered what it was. I think I heard that once and could not find the little owl because they tend to live in pretty deep forest and they're pretty well camouflaged, but it's quite an amazing sound. So again, moving to even smaller owl, tiny little northern saw wet. No ear tufts, big heart-shaped face disc, kind of reddish brown color usually, and yeah, tiny, seven inches, not much bigger than a sparrow. Beautiful little birds. And is, if you look at the range maps, it shows them being year round in all the lowland parts of Western Washington and the islands. But we were convinced for years that they were not breeding on the San Juan Islands because every little uh, saw wet owl we'd ever had coming in for care had come in in the fall and winter. So mostly November, December, January. So we thought they were moving through. Uh, sometimes they moved down from higher elevations out to the coast for the winter time. And we would presume that's what was happening. And they're very easy to identify because of this beautiful reddish brown color, but also that white Y between the eyes and above the beak. So very easy to identify. And we would get them usually when they were found in the middle of the road and often just dazzled by the headlights and not moving. People would think they were injured, pick them up, bring them to us. And we would discover they weren't actually injured. They were just freezing in place because that's the way they um, can avoid predators sometimes is just to hold still and pretend that uh, they're not there. So we were assuming that sawwets were not nesting on the San Juans until a couple of years ago when some sent us this photograph. This is a juvenile sawwet owl. Totally different coloration from the adults. You can see the dark, still got the white Y between the eyes, but totally different coloration. This one was just learning to fly. So that told us that, yeah, there must be a few of them at least nesting on the San Juans. So I wonder if you have them nesting on Camino too. So we can discuss that in a few minutes, see who's seen what on Camino. So the name Sawwet came from one of the sounds this owl makes, which is a screechy, scratchy kind of sound that people thought sounded like using a whetstone to sharpen a saw blade or a knife blade. So that's why they got the name, but there's a range of other calls they make. And this is one, again, in breeding season, male trying to find a mate. And it goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> so these are owls that we see quite often, but there are a few that we see only occasionally. 
The first one, uh, this is something that you can certainly educate me about, uh, whether you see these on Camino. But on the San Juan Islands, we don't see northern pygmy owls. The ones we see at Wolf Hollow usually come from the upper Skagit, so cedro woolly concrete kind of area. So we've never seen a pygmy owl that came from uh, the San Juan, San Juan Islands or um, the adjacent mainland. They're tiny owls, smaller than sawwets, but they have a long tail and they're slightly different shape. And they also um, often hunt during the day, dawn and dusk, but sometimes visible during the day. And they like to sit up on the top, very top of a tree or a bush, and you'll see their head bobbing and the tail flicking before they swoop down and grab a small songbird or a little mouse, etc. So it's, it can be difficult to tell the difference between them, but I think of the sawwets with their big eyes and their little heart-shaped face as kind of woodland fairies, whereas the northern pygmy owls, to me, look like a grumpy little gnome. They look like they're their eyebrows are furrowed. So a little, so, uh, little pygmy owls. This is a close up to show the, the spotted plumage that they have. And on the back of their head, they have dark false eye spots to prevent predators creeping up on them from behind. It looks like they have eyes in the back of their head. So this is one owl that I've never seen in the Sandlands. We know they're in Skagit County, and I wonder if they're on Camino. Occasionally, we we'll see a snowy owl. That's mainly when there's a, an eruption, when there's lots of lemming up in the tundra areas where these big, big white owls are breeding. So lots of the owlets survive. And then when winter sets in and the lemming population crashes, there's a lot of competition for food. So the bigger, stronger adult owls stay on their territory and some of the youngsters have to move far south. So some years you can see three or four snowy owls sitting on top of barn roofs in, in the Skagit Flats. And out on the Olympic coast, which is where this photograph was taken, they can be sitting on the driftwood like Christmas ornaments. But that only happens occasionally. And I have only ever, ever seen one snowy owl on the San Juans. So it's a pretty rare occurrence. And the males are more or less pure white, whereas the youngsters and the females are more of this mottled brown color too. But a beautiful big owl, but only seen in certain years. And another little owl, burrowing owl. So they are a little bit bigger than a sawwet, but much longer legged. And they nest in the burrows of prairie dogs or ground squirrels. So they're nesting in Eastern Washington. But apparently, occasionally, one will come over to the west side in the fall and then migrate south along the coastal areas rather than um, further inland. And that happened a few years ago. And people spotted this down on the prairies at American Camp at the south end of San Juan Island. So you can see the rabbit, European rabbit. But can you spot the little owl in the foreground? If you take a closer look, there it is. You can just see its little eyes poking out of the rabbit burrow. So it's really poor quality photograph because this was taken at quite a distance. And then the little owl came up a little bit and we were able to take a, a closer look. So this has happened on a couple of occasions and I don't know how unusual that is or whether it happens quite a lot in other parts of uh, Western Washington, but that's the only time I saw a, a little burrowing owl in this area. So these are some of the owls that we see occasionally, just from time to time, some years, not at all, and it's a pretty rare occurrence. 
So hopefully that gives you an idea of the types of owls you might look and listen for uh, in, this, in our region here. If you'd like further information, uh, the owl pages is great for all kinds of owly information of all different types about their physiology, about the behavior, etc. cetera. Uh, for local, relatively local information, Seattle Audubon's bird web section is wonderful. Wonderful uh, natural history information, distribution, where you're likely to find them at different times of the year. It's a great resource. And then Cornell Lab of Ornithology, especially the Macaulay Library for sound recordings. And they, if you want to listen to all kinds of different owl sounds, this is a great place to go. Of course, to finish up, I work for a wildlife rehab center. So I've got to talk about the hazards that owls face. We get a lot of owls for care, and the number one reason is hit by car. A lot of owls are hit by cars, mainly in the winter when it's dark, they're out hunting and people are traveling to and from work in the dark. So owls are hit, they have head injuries, eye injuries, wing injuries. So I always have to put out the message, please look out for owls when you're driving. They're easily dazzled by the headlights and uh, a lot of owls get injured in this way. So that's always my please look out for owls when you're driving. So I'm going to finish there, but I would welcome any questions or any discussion about how the owls on Camino Island differ from some of the ones on San Juan Island. Anybody have any questions they would like to ask? I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, why are they um, hit by automobiles? It be, is it, are they out in the evening hunting or what causes that? Yeah, a lot of it is, although some owls will hunt during the day, most owls are most active either dawn, dusk or mostly during the night. So in the middle of winter, when it's dark, when people are going to and from work, then there's a lot of cars on the road, a lot of owls hunting, and the edges of the road are sometimes a good place to hunt. So they're so concentrated on the vole or the mouse that they're swooping down to grab that they um, are not paying attention and they get dazzled by the headlights and they get hit. Any other questions or comments? Owls you've seen or heard on Camino? Well, I, I last January, I heard um, an owl across the street deep in the woods at night with just three hoots. And um, I it didn't, I looked for all the different hoot patterns and I couldn't find one that just said three hoots. Uh, yeah. Probably a, a great horn, though. Is that what you would think of first? Was it very uh, a nice deep kind of kind of sound? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the great horns mm -hmm. to have the the deepest voices. So if you get that really resonant kind of sound, that would be my first guess. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> We've been hearing that same sort of hooting a lot the last two two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. Very close to the house. Uh, it sounds like within 100 feet of the house. Is that common? Well, again, because they're so, uh, the great horns start nesting so early, they probably by an hour maybe have youngsters, you know, the eggs have hatched youngsters. So there's probably a pair that are communicating with each other when they're out hunting picking up food to take home to the nest. So that would be my guess as to what's going on. So communication oh. between mom and dad as to who's bringing home the, the dinner tonight. Me too. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. We often have great horn babies flying around from say the middle of the summer, June through fall. 
it seems like they just scream and scream and scream and scream. It just seems like all they're saying is, look at me, come over here and eat me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. And that's the thing is, you know, they're, they're screaming to try and get their parents to feed them, but they are attracting attention to themselves. Um, but again, I don't know many birds that would take on a great horned owl mom and dad. So, <laughs> Yeah, other than great other great horned owls, I don't think there's many things that would risk going after a young great horn if mom and dad were in the area because that could end up in tears. So if the, the babies are screaming, it probably means that the parents are nearby. Well, 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 the parents are probably off hunting the youngsters. It's like many young animals and even humans. Uh, <laughs> they will rely on the parents as long as the parents will put up with it. So rather than going out to hunt on their own, they keep going, mom, dad, could you bring me some dinner? And mom and dad gradually will bring less and less to encourage them to go out and do it themselves. Yeah. So you hear them screaming away. So really, I have to go get my own? <laughs> I have a question about nest boxes. And I'm wondering if it, uh would be beneficial to try to um, include nest boxes in a backyard birding situation. There's lots of uh, possibilities I know on Camino. And... Yeah, I mean, when you would look at the owls that nest in cavities, like the little sawwets, the western screech, uh, barn owls, of course, they often take to nest boxes because uh, Although they have the name barn owl and they often nest in barns, they also will nest in cavities in trees. So they would be the ones you're most likely to be able to um, attract or cater for by putting up boxes. And I know that there are some really good nest box uh, designs out there. In fact, I think Russell Link has got some of them in the books that you mentioned earlier, Val. And it's also the positioning of them too, because uh, Western screeches particularly would really benefit from having nest boxes, but I'm sure the placement of them is really important to give these little owls the, the cover that they need to, to nest. Do, do they actually, would they actually take to a nest box that was, that was put up like that? That's a good, I know of barn owls have been known, and I know of a few screech owls too. I don't know about sawwets, I haven't heard about that. Mm. I know that some people have, in other areas, have had success with barn owl boxes and um, western screech owl boxes. But it's kind of like bat boxes. You do everything according to plan, and then you keep your fingers crossed that they think it's a suitable place. But the more boxes that are up and around, the more chance you have of them choosing one of them. Right, fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For years, I have heard, for 16 years, I have heard the hoot hoot de hoo conversation going on all over the neighborhood. I never did see one until this summer around um, it was late afternoon, I was out in the garden doing something. I heard all kinds of craziness going on in an alder tree, and I finally walked over to see what was going on. And there was a barred owl sitting there, and he was chasing a squirrel all over that tree. <laughs> so I finally got to see one. And he just got disgusted and left. <laughs> Yeah, the, the barred owls are the ones that, as I say, not as shy as some of the other owls. So they tend to be the most visible ones. You know, they'll live in parks. I've had them working in, a, in the vegetable garden and there's a young barred owl sitting up in a tree 20 feet away watching everything I'm doing. Um, I've led birding trips for kids and there was a barred owl sitting on a branch on the edge of the woods. And I had all the kids be really quiet so we could sneak by and not disturb the owl. And, you know, like 15 kids walk underneath this owl and all it does is watch us as we go by. They isn't compared to some of the deeper wood owls that would not put up with that kind of behavior at all. So, yeah, we get mm. barred owls in action much more than others. 
You're very talkative. Yes, very. <laughs> we can hear them across the street and the properties up and down the street. Uh, their voice is carried. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And the, the, the crazy monkey laugh call that I played part of, <laughs> heard that I had no idea what was going on. I couldn't even link it with owls. And then I tracked it down and there they were. There was a pair of barred owls chatting back and forward. And I have no idea what they were saying to each other, but that sound is amazing. You keep the great horn owls. How do they learn to fend for themselves earlier if they're not being fed by parents? Well, it's kind of a gradual process. Um, I think part of it is giving them the, the, giving them the incentive to learn how to hunt properly on their own. Uh, they have the instincts, but they have to just practice until they're good at it. It's never as easy as mom and dad make it look. So it takes them a while to really fine tune their skills. But there's certainly times when the adults are going, uh, nope, I'm not bringing it to you. You can come with me and then we'll learn how to do this properly. And then gradually, but usually by about September or so, they are fine well enough. Their hunting skills have been fine-tuned enough that they can look after themselves. How do you teach them to hunt? Do you put them with oh, Yeah, how do we teach them at Wolf Hollow? Yeah. Well, as I say, a lot of it is instinct. So what we do um, initially is we're giving them a wide range of different prey, all of it's dead. <laughs> and then before they are released, we have to do live prey training. So we do breed some mice that that's what they're there for is to help these young barn owls or young great horned owls to learn that you can't expect things just to fall dead at your feet. You have to put some effort into it and learn how to catch them. So when the owlets are in some of the larger enclosures, we would do, do live prey training with them so that they go out with these skills. But do you have surrogate owls to, to act as parents or do you, no, no, they're on their own. They figure yeah. it out or they don't. Yeah, they have, they have the instincts, as I say. So what the parents are doing is supporting them while they Okay. Yeah, you've cut out there. <laughs> okay, now, okay, now you're, now, so could you repeat that? The parents are supporting them while? Yeah, the su parents are supporting them while they're learning the skills. So we try to do the same thing. Okay. We keep on feeding them while, you know, the first time they get live prey training, they're maybe not very good at it. But by the third or fourth time, they've usually got it down. They're pretty, pretty good. That's great. So we have one, uh, one question in the chat. Will they eat roadkill? Well, most owls will not eat. Um, roadkill. You know, the eagles and things, absolutely, they'll come down and eat roadkill. Owls in general catch their own prey. They, they're mostly interested in live stuff. Uh, so when we're feeding them at the rehab center, we're feeding them whole food. You know, right, uh, the dead, but mice, rats, quail, that kind of thing. Uh, and it can be difficult to convince a, an adult owl Youngsters, it's different because they're used to dead things being brought to them. But adult owls, it can be difficult to convince them this is actually food because they usually don't go for things that are already dead. Wow. Huh. Yeah. Any other questions for everybody? Or any so how dangerous are they to your pets, like small dogs and cats? Well, the main ones, um, are the great horned owls, certainly. Uh, they, as I said, their attitude is, ooh, something to eat. So <laughs> they would certainly take a small cat or dog, given the opportunity. Barred owls, maybe, uh, but mostly I'd be worried about great horned owls if you have you know, smaller pets like that, because they are the ones that take they can take prey that's you know twice their weight, 
So they, they would be the one I'd be concerned about mainly. A number of years ago, um, this wasn't on Camino, but it was out on in the Skagit area at Burr Island on uh, uh, Wiley Slough. There was a nest of great horned owls right along the trail, and it was like not very high. And I've always wondered about, they had the babies up there just waiting for the parents to come back with food. And they'd be sitting there and they would bob their heads around almost comically. Yeah. And I always wondered why they did that. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I assume it's something to do with their hearing. You know, they're, they're kind of oh. practicing. What am I hearing? How do I, you know, zoom in on this point? Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I would guess if they're bobbing their heads around, partly they're looking. We see that in outlets that we're raising at Wolf Hollow. They, they kind of do the looking around thing, um, but they're also turning their heads and listening and kind of practicing all the skills that they'll need later. Okay. Thank you. Do great horns ever hoot to warn you away from their, their nests? They seem like they hoot as soon as I leave the house or when I come home in my car. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if they're warning us or they're just commenting, commenting to their mate, uh-oh, -uh, person moving on the mm. other um, and Because great horned owls have been known to be very protective of their nesting area. You know, there's a number of places where trails had to be closed because great horned owls are swooping down and mm. people's hats from their heads or leaving us a score in the top of people's heads when they, oh. people were too close to their nests. Oh my gosh. Definitely very watchful when they have youngsters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having a great horned owl swoop down across your head is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Wear your hat. Yeah. <laughs> We've noticed that sometimes if we mimic the call, not so much with the great horned owls, but um, another one, that they will hoot back. Yes. The barred owls. The barred owls, yeah. That's, we sometimes have some fun with that. <laughs> yeah, and I know a lot of birders that when they go out looking for owls at night, that's exactly what they do is they go out and either play the sounds or imitate the sounds and see who replies and if they can draw mm -hmm. close to, to take a look at who's around. Do you think it's dangerous to do that with gray horns? <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> Yeah, I think mainly great horns um, can be a problem when they're being protective of a nest. Okay. Otherwise, I think they're just curious, like, is there another owl in my territory? Huh. But they'll take a good look before they do anything. But if if they have a nest, and especially if they have youngsters, they can be very protective in, in the area. That makes sense. And I knew one birding instructor in Texas who warned us never to play a great horned owl call. And he was firmly convinced that they would come after you. But it makes sense that it would be in nesting season when they had their nest nearby. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Have other people heard on tomato or, or close by um, anything but great horns and bards and maybe barred owls? because I know they're all here in relative abundance. The others are around, but I'm curious about if anybody has them nesting close to their houses. They may be out in the more remote areas. Which one's she asking about? The horned? Great horned? Yeah, that's one we have. Okay. Okay, just curious. It's always fun to know mm -hmm. what else is about. And I think I have barred owls in um, on the north end of the island. Yeah. And they, yeah. I have a green space next to my house and they hoot back and forth yeah. all the time. They're just starting to do it more now. Okay. So yeah. I'm thinking they're getting into probably breeding season. Yeah. 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 There's definitely some on sunset. Has anybody seen or heard northern pygmy owls on Camino? Not that I know. Would love to, but I haven't heard any.
No, I'm just surprised that they're not, as far as I know, out on the islands, but you can always get a surprise. I think that's the bar. I thought the bar was. Oh, oh no, this no, is the great right. horn that yeah. we're hearing lately. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming tonight. This was really, really fun, Shona. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very I'd much. Sure you leave, I'd like to make a pitch for Wolf Hollow and Shona. Um, it, it's not an easy task to. Uh, run a wildlife rehabilitation. So if you, um, so they, they need donations for all the, um, to, to uh, rehabilitate like seal pups. That's a massive endeavor to, um, to get a seal pup to be re-released and, and, um, and the various creatures. So if you, um, if you want to help in the cause, I put the information in there for um, finding out and, and you can get a little newsletter and find out what's going on with the critters. I think one just came in the mail just recently so you, you get updates on, on the success stories um, and it, it's really quite helpful because I know it's it's not a um, easy um, to to keep the wildlife rehabilitation centers going so that's important I know you guys are my heroes and I'm so glad there's a spot because there's so much human conflict that's hurting the critters so it's nice it's nice to have you guys available so thank you Shona and thank you um, for giving the, another program for us and thank you all for coming to the program. We'll do another one in April about native plants. Good. All right. Bye-bye.